Okay, a whole world holocaust is coming. It says in Revelation 6, 8, first of all, that a fourth of all the people die, and then warfare starts. And by the way, it says that a fourth of all people die through beasts of the earth. And it's not talking about alligators and lions. It's talking most likely because Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the guy that invented the microscope, the first time that this Dutch um, glassmaker looked through his microscope, he looked at one drop of water and he said, whoa, behold the beasties. Now he wasn't talking about the beastie boys, you know, a rock group. He's talking about the creatures in the water. And so when the Bible, they picked up that word beasts, but most of the beasts of the earth are not elephants and tigers. They're microorganisms. And it's most possible that part of the tribulation will be these vast plagues. There was an article in the New York Times three days ago that said the terrorist greatest dream is to export plagues on airplanes. And so because four billion people board airplanes every year and there's only seven billion on the planet, you could easily you know, get everybody in on some plague and spread it. So the whole world becomes a battlefield. The whole world faces starvation. Have you ever thought about the genetically modified stuff that we're eating? Have you ever tried to grow a squash from one that you got at the market and you save the seeds? It doesn't grow. We are coming to the place where if anything happens to our technological chain, there's going to be severe food shortages. So everything the tribulation says, you can see it coming. The whole world becomes a grass fire. It says that a third of all the green plants and trees die. Uh, it says that, and by the way, all the fish of the sea die. Uh, we stopped to see the red tide on the coast. And everywhere we walked, I mean, the, those puffer fish and the, the crabs were all wobbly and dying and the uh, sand dollars were coming out of the ground. Those little snaky things that are in the sand that are about that long were just, I mean, dozens of them dead. And it when Bonnie and I were talking, I said, honey, this is just like Revelation 6 says, the horrors that are coming. The whole world faces what would be described as a nuclear winter, uh, when it just a third of the sun, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, and it's the Lord describing kind of like this fallout from uh, the warfare and, and all of the plagues. And then the horror show, chapter 9, there are demon creatures that are part of the rebellion against God that are so malignant, they're so powerful, that they destroy people so fast that God keeps them locked up because they're so powerful. One of them is actually called the destroyer. Abaddon is uh, the name of that angel, the destroyer. And he was the one that went through Egypt. He's called the angel of death. He went through Egypt and in one night found the firstborn human and the firstborn animal. Did you know the U.S. Special Forces, with every gizmo we had, could never go through any place and find the firstborn and the firstborn. You'd have to poke them, do DNA, do a test, you know, and then check everybody else out and find who's the firstborn. That angel could tell who was the firstborn human and firstborn of the livestock and killed them silently. Angels are very powerful. God lets them out of the pit in chapter 9. They're actually here in earth incarcerated in a pit they can't get out until that moment oh the whole world becomes a nightmare but that's why the church in israel have distinct roles we are part of the church we're supposed to be a light to the world sharing the gospel until we're taken out and then israel takes over and god starts the 144,000. that's israel's role there are 12,000 from each of the tribes that are sealed that's not in this section okay Where's the rapture in Revelation? The rapture in Revelation is right where I showed you in Philadelphia, kept from the hour. It's also in chapter 4 where he says, come up here. And if you notice, the church is mentioned over 20 times in chapter 1, 2, and 3 and never mentioned again. That's significant. Where'd it go? It went around the throne. And all of the saints, the redeemed saints, are worshiping the Lord. The rapture is not Christ's second coming. Jesus always describes his second coming around Israel. The whole context of Matthew 24 is Israel. It's, it's 
postured that you're living over there and looking at Jerusalem and when you see the temple defiled run to the hills it's for Israel but Jesus is the key to the blessed hope so that's the message of Philadelphia and basically the most important part to us is there's only one thing you can take with you to heaven people are you taking someone with you to heaven are you sowing and watering and letting God bring the increase? Are you sharing gospel tracts? Are you sharing verbal witnesses? Are you taking people with you to heaven? I had a friend, he was an elder at the International Church of Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. My good friend pastored the church, Mark Fonestock. This guy was the chairman of the elders. His name was Andy Meekins. He was an international businessman. He lived in Ethiopia, he flew all over the world. He got on a flight one time out of Addis Ababa and a terrorist took over the flight. And the terrorists crashed the airplane that Andy Meekins, chairman of the elders of the International Church, was on. His wife survived. The terrorists crashed it in the ocean, and it cartwheeled, went end over end. And this was in the 90s, before most of you were born. But Andy's wife texted us. I still remember it. Or faxed us. It was before texting. She sent a fax. That's a piece of paper that comes through a machine with a message on it. And she faxed us. And I'll never forget that, going And she said, I have to tell you what happened to Andy. She said, we were sitting on the airplane. The terrorists took over the plane with their machetes and hacked and took the flight and said, we're going to crash this plane. And she said, when they said those words, we're going to crash this plane, she said, there was a distinct snap of my husband's seatbelt. She said, he got out of his seat and beginning at our row, sat on the armrest of each row of the airplane and earnestly looked across the aisle and shared the gospel with anybody that would listen. Then he turned to the row he was sitting on and shared the gospel. And then he went to the next row and went, and he went down. She said, in her text, she said, I was paralyzed with fear, knowing we were going to die. She said she was doing all the, you know, you crunch over and hold your knees and everything because the plane was going down. And she said, it was at that moment I heard the distinct snap of my husband's seatbelt. And she said, before the plane hit the water, she said he'd made it to the back of the plane. Of course, Andy didn't survive, uh, but his wife did. But he took people off the airplane with him to heaven. Is that something you'd think about? Or would you be holding on to your knees? Nothing wrong with either one. Self-protection's fine. He had a higher calling. He said, hey, if we're going to die, I'm going to take as many with me as possible. That's what people in Philadelphia were blessed by the Lord with. Okay, now Laodicea, and we have to buzz through Laodicea before chapel. Uh, this is looking at the tell of Laodicea. We're standing in a cotton field, and, and the kind of the bare hill in front of you is all that's left of Laodicea. The lesson is beware of not needing Jesus every day. And somewhere in your notes in the 200s, this title is there. And this is an important section for you to read. And I gave you this, actually, this devotional. Uh, I, I have cut the book of Revelation up into 365 pieces. It's a whole year devotional where it's called Living Hope for the End of Days uh, on Amazon. And, and it's just a daily devotional, but you've got it all right here, uh, not chopped up. But this lesson is one of the most important. Seven bad habits of believers that sicken Christ and make him vomit. Look what I mean. Jesus said this to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right? These things says the amen. Amen means truly. The faithful and true witness. I mean, Jesus is the only one that's witnessed the beginning, the ending, and everything in between. And he says, trust me, and you will know what you need to know for life. I'm the faithful and true witness. I'm the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. I know that you're neither cold nor hot. Now let me work on that for a minute because look what he says. I would that you were cold or hot. Now think for a minute. Do you really think that cold means bad, sinful, wicked, distant from the Lord, and hot means zealous, soul winning, and singing, and really fiery for the Lord? Do you think that Jesus would say, I would that you either be fiery and hot or sinful and wicked and distant and far from me? See, that's what it means to me. And that's one of the dangers of, the, of not interpreting the Scriptures, just applying them and saying, well, to me, this means this. In the context, when Jesus said, I would 
that you were cold or hot, what did that mean to someone living in Laodicea? That's the question an interpreter asks. Not to me. I want to be hot, not cold. Mm -mm. Both are good. If you were in Laodicea, you would understand that. Because you're lukewarm. Boy, did that ring a bell. You see, Laodicea is between Hierapolis and Colossae, if you look at a map. Hierapolis is known as the hot springs capital. It's kind of like everybody laid around these pools of hot water, and it just was this wonderful place. Colossae was known as a place where they had these deep springs that came out of the mountains, and it was kind of like the water that they bottle on the bottled water shows, you know, where it's like pure, fresh spring water. And it was cold with no refrigeration needed. So in Hierapolis, the water is hot, and, and it just, you know, fixed all your aches and pains. In Colossae, the water was cold and refreshing. And when you came in from a hard day's work, you just got it right out of the wall, and it was perfect, like it came out of the cooler at the, you know, speedway or whatever gas station you went to, racetrack. But Laodicea was between Hierapolis and Colossae. And Laodicea didn't have any water supplies, but the Romans conveniently built aqueducts. And they built an aqueduct from Colossae, and that fresh, cold spring water came through about, I don't know, eight or ten miles of aqueduct. And when the cold Colossae water got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. And when the hot, vibrant, refreshing spring water from Hierapolis came through, it was lukewarm. So everybody in Laodicea immediately went, oh, wish that we were cold and refreshing, wish that we were hot and therapeutic, but we're not. And by the way, the hot springs had a little sulfur to it, and so it made the water kind of smell like rotten eggs. And so that whole picture of vomiting, and by the way, I will spew thee out of my mouth, Someday, any of you, well, some of you already are married, but whenever you get married and you have children, you learn that there's vomiting and then there's projectile vomiting. And projectile vomiting is when the kids are so sick, they go, Mom, help! And it goes, <laughs> kind of like a flamethrower. That's the exact Greek word that's used. Jesus said, I want to projectile you out because you you are not willing to allow my spirit to make you a vessel that will bring refreshment, that will bring renewal to people, and you are not one that will encourage and be like hot therapy to bring them back into service because they're aching and unable. You are just nothing. You're lukewarm. So it's not, it's not be hot and not cold. It's don't be lukewarm. Be refreshing. Be therapeutic, which is the word equipping, which is mending, which is part of the epistles. Because you say I'm rich, why were they lukewarm? They say I'm rich. Every one of you in this room are rich. I can assure you that. If you've never traveled, travel. You're rich. Your watch is worth more if you have one. Your shoes are worth more. Your clothes, you, most of you have electronic gizmos. Where Bonnie and I go, people earn a dollar a day and they're, they're doing well. A dollar a day to live on, to sleep on, to eat on, and to buy clothes. A dollar a day. Did you know that a great, vast number of people earn less than $700 a year? $700? Most Americans spend more than that on coffee, you know, or whatever. It, it's amazing how much we have. We're all rich. We're increased with goods. I remember the person from India that came to visit the pastor in California. You've all heard this story. And they drove up to his house, and they parked, and they got out of the car. And the man said, uh, they started walking. You know, they parked in front of the garage, but they went in the front door. And the man from India said, well, who lives in that house? They said, oh, that's the garage. He said, but who lives in there? They said, our car. He said, you have a house for your car? He said, that house is bigger than five families. The garage, the house for your car is bigger than five families in India. You have a house for your car? And you know, immediately that pastor thought, 
we are rich, and we are, and increased with goods. We have need of nothing. We don't know that we're wretched. You know what would be really neat? If all of us could have a pair of glasses that we put on that showed us the spiritual condition of people around us. Have you ever seen a little child sitting on a chair and they're so little, their feet are swinging because they're not long enough to touch the floor? And if you see them sitting in a chair and their little feet don't touch the floor, you go, oh, that's so cute. They're so little. They need help. You know, they get put in booster chairs. They get put in car seats. They're little people. They sit in the front row of church and their little feet are... I used to love to watch them swing in their feet. And you could tell when it was interesting, their feet slowed down, and when I was boring, their feet went faster, you know? You just watch them. Did you know that if someone is 60 years old and they're still in a car seat and in a high chair and a booster seat, you know what we'd say? That they're handicapped. They're challenged. They're physically challenged. They have some impediment. If they are still needing to be carried around, if they, no long, if they can't feed themselves, what do we say? We have compassion on them because they're handicapped. You know what? Failure to thrive, that's when a child doesn't grow, they don't eat, they don't progress. If you could put on glasses and see people spiritually, and walk through most churches, 90% of the people in the church, their feet would not touch the floor. They can't eat on their own. Someone has to spoon feed them. And if someone doesn't watch them, they never eat spiritually. They're constantly hurting themselves and getting in trouble spiritually. See, that's what's wrong. They were rich, increased with goods. They didn't need anything, they thought, but they didn't know that they were wretched, they were miserable, they were poor, they were blind, they were naked. And so now the Lord exhorts them. Remember, with every one of these churches, his exhortation really hit them because he talks in terms of their geography. I counsel thee to buy gold tried in the fire. Do you know what Laodicea was known as? It was a very wealthy town. They were a gold processing city. There was great wealth. Kind of like uh, South Africa used to have the, the uh, maybe they still do, those diamond mines and the gold mines and the, the platinum mines, and there was a lot of wealth. Probably still is, and that stuff's all still in the ground, probably. He's talking what they're understanding. The city of Laodicea was uber wealthy. He says, you ought to get gold from me that you could really be rich. You guys think you're rich? You're not. You ought to get my gold. It's the real gold. And white raiment that you may be clothed. By the way, Laodicea, in your notes you'll find, number two, was known as a city. They had black sheep that had wool that was the softest, finest wool of the ancient world. And if you were high class and it was winter, rainy season, you had one of these silky, beautiful black woolen outfits and people were proud of wearing them and that's why Jesus said you ought to get your clothing from me instead of you're just thinking of externals of Laodicean wool and anoint your eyes with salve did you know that the city of Laodicea was an ophthalmolic hospital center they had actually ophthalmology is the, the medicine of the eyes. They had actually invented a salve that the ancients put on their eyes for all the different s infections and stuff that people in the ancient world that had limited health care needed. So you could buy this stuff there and keep it for years and whenever you got some kind of a, a terrible eye infection, this salve that had metals in it and all kinds of stuff that they had perfected was just the wonder drug back then because there were a lot of optical problems. Jesus said, why don't you anoint your spiritual eyes with the eye salve only I can give because when I give you eye salve, you can see something in the Bible every day. Did you know I've read the Bible so many times, yet every time. When I was reading God's word this morning, it was as, as amazingly just fascinating to me as it was 40 years ago. Do you know why? Because the Lord wants to anoint our eyes to see him in his word every day. And as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Hey, have we already talked about that? 
if you're really a believer and you're not doing the right thing, God will rebuke and chasten, he promised. Therefore, what? What's the last word up there? Repent. Repent. No matter how many steps you take away from the Lord, it's one step back. Repent, he said. He always says repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him and will sup with him and he with me. Now that's a great salvation application. That Jesus is knocking at the heart door of everyone. Now, the reason I know that's true is it says it in Acts 17. It doesn't say it here. This is not a salvation verse, but it can be used that way. But the interpretation is Jesus is saying to them, I'm outside your life, I'm knocking, I want to come in and meet with you in a meal. Did you know that every day Jesus Christ is sitting across his word from you, waiting for you to come and have a meal with him? Not to check it off that you did it. So everyone asks, did you do your quiet time? Yeah, I did it. But did you actually have a date with Jesus Christ? Did you ever meet someone that asked you out and you could tell they were checking you off the list? Boy, you don't want to go out with them again. It was just for whatever reason. They weren't concerned about you. They are just concerned about the event. Jesus dining with us is the greatest moment of our day. That's why I love to start my day. Meeting with him. Talking with him. Learning from him. Hearing his voice. When you read the Bible, you hear the voice of the Lord. He calls it his word. And he calls it his voice. And he speaks to us. Not telling us, you know, the lottery numbers. He speaks to us his word and gives us understanding. I want to sup with you, Jesus said, and you with me. And to him that overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I overcame and sat down with my Father in heaven, which is another assurance that all believers get to heaven. He that has an ear. What he's saying is true believers will respond to this call. Seven messages, seven applications, but only one acceptable response. Laodicea, by the way, that's a pipe coming in from Hierapolis. Do you see all the calcification? I mean, the whole, that's the ruins of Laodicea. All this stuff about the hot and cold water is clear as day. Uh, that's Colossae where, see, the, look at the white snow-capped mountains. Can you imagine the water coming from Colossae, how cold it was and how lukewarm it got? So what are the seven bad habits? Well, Jesus lists them. In verse 14, it's spiritual neutrality. I'm rich, increase in goods, and I don't need anything. I, I don't need anything. It's spiritual self-sufficiency. I think I can make it on my own. How many days can you go without the Lord? Spiritual insensitivity. You don't feel the need. I meet people all the time that they say, why are you spending so much time? I mean, why do you tape? I mean, this is the biggest conversation getter. Stewardesses, stop and look when we're sitting on planes. I'll have my phone on my leg here. And you know how they say, turn them off, you know, and whatever. And I'm right there looking, and they cannot figure out what that is. And, and finally I'll say, it's my verse card. They go, verse from the Bible. They go, why? Why? See, that's the normal person. Why? They're not spiritually sensitive. They don't realize that the sword of the Spirit is the only defense against our adversary, the devil. That if you're constantly overwhelmed with some temptation, there's only one way to resist the devil with the sword of the Spirit. Spiritual wastefulness. You think you're rich. You think you're filling your life with fun and with experiences and with pleasures and with, with all kinds of accomplishments. The Lord says, you don't know what real wealth is. Boy, Andy Meekins knew what real wealth was when he unbuckled his seatbelt. See, God wants a group of people that will go out in the world and unbuckle to security and, and go to some of those hospitals in the closed countries, the 64 closed countries. If classes were two hours long instead of one, I would tell you story after story after story of what it's like to live within eyesight of ISIS, to live within eyesight of the Houthi rebellion, to live within eyesight of the uh, Taliban. I mean, one hospital that we serve the doctors at, they have had 12 doctors there, and six of them have been shot dead by the Taliban, who regularly comes to the hospital and will pick one doctor out and shoot him, kill him, and then leave. I met a doctor. 
he was grieving. His friend was the one that was killed. I said, um, what are you going to do? He says, go back. I said, what? He said, why don't you, you know, move somewhere safe like Florida or something? He said, why? He said, I was called to take the gospel to Afghanistan. And he said, I'm gonna, he said, there are groups translating. He says, we have house churches going on. God is doing the most remarkable work in the Muslim world. He said, to depart is far better. How do you deal with people that really think heaven is better than living on earth? Wow, there aren't very many of them. Most of us, heaven can wait. <laughs> you know, let's enjoy. Spiritual neglect. Do you realize it's not just defensive? We can grow in our capacity of knowing God. You, you heard, I, I mean, I was here listening to your lecture where um, uh, I think it was Marshall Wicks was saying that there's no limit that we'll spend eternity knowing God. Guess what? You can learn about him here. Spiritual blindness. People don't even see what God's doing in the world. Spiritual laxity. Uh, this, this whole idea of, of having no discipline in our lives. Okay, by the time we get to page 206, the scriptures, and I give you a whole list of verses, understanding what Jesus loves and he hates. I can always bring it back because so many of you are in the age of dating. If I loved Bonnie, and I do, and if she told me I hate you know, this or this or this, if I loved her, I would avoid this and this and this. If you're engaged to Jesus Christ, you should know what the Bible says. In fact, one of the times I read through the Bible, I looked for everything that displeased God and that he that was an offense, an abomination, and that he hated because I love him. Avoid these bad habits. Uh, and chapter, I mean, uh, page 210 or somewhere around, I actually go through the habits and explain them, uh, what they are. Laodicea was not living in the shadow of the cross. By the way, the epistle to the Galatians was to the region Laodicea is in. So they got a copy of that letter. And they were not being crucified with Christ. They were not letting Christ live through them. They were not living in the shadow of the cross. Galatians 2.20 is the purpose statement every one of us should have for living. Do you all have it memorized? Let's say it out loud. You guys ready? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Come on, don't you know it? Yet not I but Christ. How many of you know Galatians 2.20? Hold your hand up high, real high. Higher. <gasps> your youth pastors have never said you should know Galatians 2.20. Have you ever heard of Galatians 2.20? <gasps> Why don't you look it up? Let's read it out loud. It might be the best thing you guys do today. Some of you need to sit up. Three of you are asleep. I'm going to start my uh, youth pastor stuff where I walk down the aisle and stand by the one that's sleeping. So you better bump them. Okay, Galatians 2.20, who has it? I need a brave soul. Who has a good reading voice? Caleb, are you a good reader? Are you there yet? No. Daniel, do you have it? You don't like to read out loud. I understand being from DR. Who has it? To, oh, Bill. Commander Bill, read it for us. Thank you. That's a blessing. In fact, do you know what I told Bill this morning? I said, you're a blessing. And he went, why? I guess you guys don't tell him he's a blessing. You should. Do you know what a blessing is? When you see a reflection of God in something. That's a blessing. Like in a sunrise, like in the stars, like in the birth of a, or of a child or some glorious sight in nature, or when you see God reflected in a person. You know, every time a human does something kind and loving, that's a reflection of God because we are not like that. We're selfish. We're desperately wicked. And so if you see anybody, I even tell pagans, you want to really upset a lost person, tell them that they're a blessing, and they go, what, what, what is that? I'm not in church. What are you talking about? And I say, oh, I just saw God reflected in you. How? I mean, they're just so fascinating. They don't know anything about God. What does Galatians 2.20 say? It's the exchange life. I'm living in the present based on the past, that Jesus Christ gave himself for me. Do you know what Galatians 2.20 is? It's Paul's testimony. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. Do you know why most of us don't have impactful ministry in others' lives? Because we talk about stuff in the third person. We talk about it in arm's length. We don't talk about 
what we're living. We just say the Bible says that. When I was on staff with John MacArthur for five years, do you know what he told me? He says, don't try and live up to your preaching. He said, preach what you're living. Boy, that first sermon was really hard. I had to find the parts I was living before I could communicate it. And that is what God wants. Do you know what the most powerful thing is? For you to live out the truth of Christ. For you to live what Hebrews 7.13 says, after the power of an endless life. That's why Andy Meekins unbuttoned his seatbelt. He knew he had endless life. And he was ready to go meet the Lord. Uh, Galatians 6.14 is our emancipation proclamation. Laodicea knew that. The cross saves us from the hold of sin and the hunger for sin. And the world has been crucified to me. Am I? My pack is making noises. This is Nathaniel, the servant of the Lord. of life. Thank you. You're a blessing. God can crucify the world to us. Do you struggle with some sin? Do you struggle with, with anxiety or fear or, uh, you know, this self-image that you think you don't like the way God made you or you, you, you want constant approval from people? Do you struggle with those things or with moral things or with, with things from your past? Guilt? The world the sins of this world, have been crucified to me. Jesus Christ has already defeated every sin. Uh, I was preaching one day, and I noticed something curious happening. Every time when I would preach my sermon, I would say, in conclusion, and this fellow that was sitting up there in the balcony got up and left. So the first Sunday he did it, I thought he had to go to the restroom. The second Sunday he did it, I thought he was late to work. The third Sunday he did it, I thought, what is going on? Every time I said, in conclusion, as I conclude, he would leave. Concurrent with that, I was teaching through Romans at that time, I started getting phone calls at 2 a.m. every day on our home phone. And the home phone was downstairs, our bedroom was upstairs, we had all these little children, uh, you know, sleeping in their cribs, it was an old house, and the phone woke them up and they'd cry and everything, so as soon as the phone rang, I'd run downstairs to answer it at 2 a.m. I, I started getting up and walking so I could get it, on the first ring. And all that would happen is a voice would start cussing me out with the most vile four-letter strings of, you know, you're nothing but a, you know, mother, what, and, what, and, what, and, and a, all the worst things they could think of. And I would say, uh, you know, can I help you? Can I help? Because it was a parsonage, you know, it was the church phone number. So, you know, I was on duty. Well, about, you know, 14, 24, 30 days of that going by, you, even though it's 2 a.m., you kind of get used to the voice. Well, I was teaching through Romans on homosexuality. That's in Romans 1. And I was talking about homosexuality is not biblical and it's not God's plan and it is forgivable, but unrepented of, it's damnable. You know, just the simple gospel message. And I would say in conclusion and he would get up. So one day, I didn't say, in conclusion, I worked it out with the chairman of the elders. He was sitting in the front. And as I got near the end of the message, I walked to the bottom of the stairway. There was only one stairway out of the balcony. And I stood at the bottom of the stairway, and I said, and now Norm is going to close the service in prayer. And I stood at the bottom of the stairway. Boop, he got right up. He was coming down the stairs, looking down. And I moved in front of him. I said, hello. So he moved over. So I said, hello. And he moved over and said, hello. And he could tell I wasn't going to let him out. And so he lifted his eyes from the floor and said, hello. And I said, you're my 2 a.m. friend. I said, I recognize your voice. And that started an amazing time. His name was Al. He was a homosexual activist. He had had 600 different sexual male partners. He was mad at us because we had a free clinic downtown where we did uh, HIV testing, and he had tested positive. Of course, we did it all the right way, put it in a sealed envelope, total confidential, HIPAA, everything else. But 
We told him he had a death sentence from his aberrant lifestyle, and he was going to die faster than everybody else because he had AIDS, and he was angry, and he did a lot of bad stuff in our church. Uh, but what he really was angry was for me preaching about it on the radio and at church. And so he would listen if I said anything bad, and that's what he would curse about all week long in the phone calls. Well, to make a long story short, Al met with me. I learned so much about homosexuality, their, their, what they go through. There's so much uh, jealousy. They all carry bricks wrapped with uh, cloth in their cars. Well, not all of them, but many of them. Because their favorite mode of getting back to each other, when this guy is with your guy, you take your brick and you plaster him in the face. And Al had had so many reconstructive face surgeries because he'd been bricked because he had 600 partners to catch AIDS from. But all that to say this, he got saved wonderfully, gloriously. Before his salvation, he never looked up. I used to talk to him for an hour, and he would only look at the floor. He never would look at me unless you got underneath and went like that, you know, to see his eyes. He never would look up. When he got saved, just like that, his eyes just, a total transformation. The night that I baptized him, the local ACT UP chapter, that's the homosexual activist chapter, threatened our church publicly. They said that, that Al is known in the, the homosexual gay community and they were going to harm the cars in the parking lot for anybody that came to his baptism. And so the state troopers came, you know, they wear those big boots up to their knees, you know, and those big guns and everything, and dark outfits. We had troopers all through the parking lot. They were standing around the church and Al was getting baptized. And I was already in the baptistry and the chairman of the elders was so concerned. He said, no one else can be baptized that night. I said, why? They said, they might get AIDS from him. I said, well, he'll be last then. He said, but you might get AIDS. I said, don't worry. From being in the baptistry? No, don't worry about it. But this guy was like 80 and he was so paranoid. And so Al was coming down to give his testimony and I heard the sound of water dripping. And I thought, what is that? And I looked back and there's the dear chairman of the elder and he had an entire gallon of Clorox and he was pouring it into the baptistry hoping to kill the AIDS virus, you know. I thought, how sweet. But Al gave his testimony, and to his dying day, he became a track-carrying, Bible-carrying, gospel-sharing, radiant proclaimer of Christ. Because the cross saves us from the hold of and the hunger for sin, and the world gets crucified to us. Well, that's the gospel we should be sharing. So I've been crucified to the world, but unsanctified living, not being crucified, sickens Christ. And those seven habits Jesus wants to see, I should be repenting of spiritually being neutral. I should say, I'm not neutral, I'm for God. Anything that his word is for, anything he is for, I am for it. I don't want to be self-sufficient. I can't do it. Not that we're as sufficient of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. And we need to believe that when we're weak, he's strong. I should repent of being spiritually insensitive. Do you know what Jesus' most common emotion was? I told you that the first day. The most frequent emotion of Christ was compassion. The Greek word is splank noi. It's, it's the Greek word for intestines. You know how you get scared, you feel it right here in your stomach? They felt, the Greek Roman world, felt that the seat of our emotions was right here. Now, it's interesting, 2,000 years later, what do we say? We say, I love you with all my what? Heart. And so when we love someone, we give them a chocolate what? Heart. Or, you know, Valentine's or something. Do you know what in the Roman time they gave you? If a guy really liked you, he gave you chocolate intestines. Because he thought that was, not really, that was a joke, okay? Did you catch that? That's a, but they thought this was it. Jesus said, I am moved in the very center of you know, all my visceral, my stomach area, I feel compassion. That's how much he loves us. We need to repent of being insensitive. We need to be compassionate like him. He wants us to repent of spiritual wastefulness. That's why it says redeem the time. You'll never be 20-some years old again. When I was your age, I was memorizing a verse every day. 
Do you know why? I was a courier taking Bibles in. I didn't know what year I was going to be put in jail. I would never have a Bible the rest of my life. I wanted to have as many Bible verses memorized as I could. I learned a verse a day all the way through seminary. Do you know how many that is? 17 or 1,800. That's what I carry to Starbucks at 5 a.m. I'm reviewing my piles of verses. I don't think I'm going to go to jail for carrying Bibles anymore. I think I'm going to probably lose my sight and be in some nursing home, and I want to be able to have the Scriptures with me. Do you understand? Don't waste your life. God wants us to repent of spiritual neglect, spiritual blindness. Did you know when the Lord helps you see, you see the world differently? You see it as he sees it. You see people like lost sheep without a shepherd. They're sitting in the darkness, ready to plunge in the pit, and you want to help them. And you see believers that their little feet don't touch the floor and you want to nurture them. He wants us to repent of spiritual laxity. So Laodicea learned to live in the shadow of Christ's cross. That's what the, uh, the whole letter is about. The first command of the book of Romans. Do you know where it is? Have you guys done Romans yet? It's chapter 6, verse 11. Why don't you look at it with me for a minute? Some of you uh, need to, to uh, maybe ponder what this means. The whole book of Romans... Romans chapter 6. The whole book of Romans is Paul presenting what salvation is. And he talks in, you know, in chapter 1 about the decline and fall of the human race. In chapter 2, the Israel the oracles. In chapter 3, that the whole world is sin. In chapter 4, about the righteous faith of Abraham. In chapter 5, the byproduct of justification. And then you get to chapter 6. And look what he says in verse 11. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves. Now, wait a minute. In Greek, if you command someone to do something, it's a three-letter Greek ending you put on the verb. It's just three little letters. Eta, tau, eta. Uh, and you just, eta. That's an imperative. It's a command. In English, if you command, you say, stop! You raise your voice. Or if you're older and typing a text, you put it in capital letters. And if you're really bad, you put it in capital and bold. You know, that's a command. In the Bible, it's a form of the verb. Did you know that chapter 6, verse 11 is the first command in the book of Romans? There's six chapters of truth, and then because of that truth, God says, boom, verse 11, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin. There's no sin that has to control us. I told Al, Mr. Homosexual, that he did not have to be controlled by his homosexual desires. He might struggle with them the rest of his life because the flesh never leaves us, but he no longer was chained by them. Why? Because you're alive unto God. Therefore, here's the second imperative. There, there's a string of them. This is significant in the structure of Romans. Verse 12, therefore, do not let sin. Did you know we're commanded not to allow sin to reign in our lives? That means if there is sin in our lives, that we're allowing when, when it's enslaving us, when people have habits that they cannot break, Christ has already broken them, they just are not allowing him to set them free. That's the first command in Romans. I gave you the survey of one through six, but the command is to live a daily crucified life. To say, Lord, these aren't my hands, I want them crucified with you. These are not my feet, I want to be crucified. I want to go through life with you. And it's the power of the sanctifying life of Christ lived out through me. And it's operating on what I know is true. You see, we live on the road. Our salary is deposited in a bank in Owasso, Oklahoma, and it goes through the system to the ATMs, and when we're standing in Turkey or in Greece, we're going to be, and, and next week we'll be in London, when we poke our card in, we believe that inside that machine there's a record of our income and that we can withdraw from that ATM what we need. And no one thinks you're a great person of faith if you use your ATM card to get cash out, your debit card. But that's what the Christian life is like. God has already deposited strength to say no to any sin, strength to overcome any sin, strength to be bold when you're not bold, strength to have illumination to understand his word. He's already deposited all that. Prayer is when we just withdraw it. We say, I believe you, I, I ask for this. Operating what we know is true. Laodicea was not operating the truth of the cross. Unsanctified living was the sickening condition 
But God says he wants us to have sanctified habits, repenting of neutrality, allowing the sanctifying life of Christ. You understand the gospel could be reduced to this, that the justifying death of Jesus Christ opens for me the sanctifying life. I no longer have to live like I was. I can now live with Christ living out through me. And when Christ lives out through me, there is love and joy and peace and gentleness and meekness and temperance and faith and goodness. All those things are Christ living out through me, not me trying harder. That's the gospel. And that, on page 223 or something, I have the seven, the list of the, the sanctifying power of Christ and we need to get used to sharing that with people. Most of us are, are like the Dead Sea. We're getting truth, 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 and we're not giving it out. You know, when you go to Israel, there's the Sea of Galilee, the most life-filled thing, and then there's the Dead Sea that's dead. The only difference between them is one is getting and giving, and the other is only getting. The Dead Sea only receives. It never gives out. And Christians that only take in knowledge and never share it, never live it and share it, they just, well, they get over full. Laodicea also tells us how we listen to Jesus. He's the God we can trust. You know, if he said, be not unequally yoked to unbelievers, that means you don't even date them, if you really believe he's true. It, you don't yoke your life to someone that's not a believer and hope they get saved. Listen to Jesus. He's the amen. He's the faithful and true witness. But Jesus diagnoses their life, and he says, I see what we've talked about. I want you to repent of these. Anything unsurrendered. See, anything in my life that's out of control is not under Christ's control. That's the bottom line. That's the whole page you're looking at. Anything out of control. If my appetite's out of control, if my time is out of control, if my habits, uh, my, my thoughts, my desires, my anxieties are out of control, I have not surrendered them to Christ. And we have to keep re-surrendering every day. Are you listening to Jesus? He's saying, repent. Laodicea also, and I wish I had time to go through this, but if you are interested at all, you can read it. Jesus warns about the danger of having too much stuff. And basically what he says is, and I give you Ecclesiastes 5, that's a good one to mark in your Bible. The more you have, the more you want. The more you have, the more you can lose. The more you have, the more you worry about it. See, possessions are draining. Most of us have been raised to think the American dream is to get all you can get. God says, don't. Give all you can give, but don't get all you can get because it's deadening. Christ constantly exposed the dangers of wealth. In fact, you know what he said? He said, riches make it hard to go to heaven. 